Hi everybody, welcome back. Uh, this is Phil and um, we're going to move forward and start talking a little bit about part of our next phase of drawing here, which involves us being able to use texture. And um, um, I'm applying this towards um, the class going out and sketching organics and plant life because I think plant life, um, whether it be roots, stems, leaves, um, tall plants, short plants, leafy plants, you name it, is a really, really great uh, sample to look at in terms of understanding texture rules. Um, later on, when you, you know, you can look at fish and birds and there's some other, you know, detailed animals and insects that also have some cool texture variants. But I think for right now, um, this will tie in and I think it works pretty good. So let's start off by taking a look at, I took this picture the other day um, when I was over uh, drawing at the Florton Arboretum. And um, I thought it was a really nice picture because it showed a lot of transition happening with gradients. You have a really pretty tree here in the foreground uh, and limb. And this, uh, there's also some really cool uh, elements in the back here as well. And so you can see lots of nice texture. I mean, look at this, this sort of vine structure that's coming off down through here. It looks quite nice. Um, but what's really important to me is looking at the light source. So part of the light's hitting and we're getting dark areas over here. We're getting some dark areas back here. You have some uh, light, excuse me, light sort of coming down from above. And so it's, it's crossing part of this plane. And so what happens with all of this, basically, when we get to a point where we have to put this on paper, is we need to start understanding uh, a tonal gradation and what happens with that gradient. Okay, so a gradation or a gradient is when we have black going from pure black, which might be the value um, of like, you know, you could pretty much say it would be like a, a 10. That's how I like to think of it. So if I come over here, um, what I do is I might write this down in the back of my brain. Hold on, what happened to my color here? I think of that as being a, a, a 10, basically. Okay, and that's weird. I lost my color. Let's see what happened. There we go. Okay, so I think of this right here. That's my, my 10 and my scale. And then when I come over here, I think of my white as a pure zero. And the reason why I do that is because that's how markers work for me. So when I buy like a 20% grade gray marker to sketch with, it's going to be in the neighborhood about right there. And then if I come over here and I'm imagining right here in about the middle, that might be about 50 so obviously we have about 80, we have about 70, and right here we have, you know, 30 to 40, you know, and so on. So this is important for me because when I go out and sketch or I'm in my sketchbook, I tend to use markers that are in the 20 grade, the about 60 grade. And actually I've sort of changed. I used to go 60, 80. Now I'm sort of fine. I really don't go too dark. So I usually stick with about um, a 70 grade marker. Um, and I have about a, you know, somewhere between a four and five. And the reason why I say that is because different manufacturers make their marker inks a little bit different. And sometimes some come out darker than others. And then I stick with like a light 20 grade. So those are the three markers that I take with me. But there's an importance there because as artists, you have to realize and understand that pure black is at 10 and we get a gradient pass going all the way over here to zero. So you can look at part of this and you might say like, you know, hey, um, there really is no pure 10 of pure black in here um, at the moment. Pure black would be back here, like in the very background of part of this where there's complete shadow. So because of that, um, we might look at this shadow on here and realize like this shadow casting from these leaves up above are actually going to be at about a you know, maybe a, a 60 to 80% ratio. And then also when we look at these highlights, so white is going to be pure. So there might be like a pure little highlight right there. There might be a little pure highlight on the edge right there. But for the most part, um, that's not 100% pure. So this area in here is going to be somewhere floating between, you know, like a 60 to 50 to 40. And then as it goes up here, it gets lighter. So there's little gradient passes that you have to understand how to place inside your work. Now, the most important thing about a gradient is that we can create gradient passes with texture. And so that's something that a lot of people don't think about. So when I come over here, I put some close up of some plant leaf texture and you can see this one down here has sort of this 
Um, almost looks like some type of a base reptilian scales. Okay, um, but this is plant leaf texture. And then there's another one here that has much more of a, of a vine flow to it where it's going through a branching hierarchy structure where you have one main vein and then after that pops another one. And then from there goes a secondary to a third and it keeps on splintering down. And then it came across this, which is another sort of plant texture. And it's almost like a protective heavy duty type of leaf covering that develops. So here's the thing about nature is nature has all kinds of really cool subject matter with all different types of um, surfaces and skin colors um, that have been, you know, sort of that has evolved over time to protect the the look and feel of the plant, whether it's maybe it's a plant exposed to extreme sun or rain or whatever it might be. OK, so that means we need to think about that in our drawing and be able to apply it towards what we're working on. OK, so even on this example, here's another close up of this tree. Look at the bark patterning in that tree. So I try to blow it up here as much as I could. Um, and you could see some of the bark here taking place and you can see these transitions that are happening right here. OK, hold on a minute. I keep losing my my pen tool. There we go. And so you can see some of the. Sorry, go back here. You can see the bark patterning in here and in here and you can see it taking place. So if I'm going to draw this, I get to think about part of those pattern structures and how they work. So. You know, the reason why I'm showing you this is this leads us to understanding pattern and tone. So basically, gradients have the ability to act as pattern and tones. And a really great exercise for you to do is to, I just pulled these off Pinterest, okay, um, is to construct patterns and think of different patterns and how those patterns can wrap over and flow through objects and what that's going to communicate to the viewer. So when I'm drawing and sketching, I'm always thinking of different patterns. I like to use circles a lot. I've used scales quite a bit. I use little circle shapes. This is great. This pattern right here reminds me of that reptilian sort of leafy, you know, um, pattern I showed you. You have patterns of fur. You can have other patterns of actually separate textured elements like leaves or even flower tips that become patterns, right? You can have positive and negative shapes. So there's so much to do. I actually have a bunch of, of other samples here I'd like to show you guys to talk about this because when I looked online, just to give credit, this guy is Nicholas Amorosi. Um, I saw this and I'm like, hey, that's a fantastic thing to do for a sketchbook. I wish I was taught this when I was younger. And I wasn't taught this. I sort of had to learn it on my own. So when I, it's funny, when I think of patterns and teach a basic drawing class, I'm trying to get students that there's an endless amount of patterns. You have vertical patterns, cross patterns, circular patterns, hair club patterns. Uh, I mean, you have spiral patterns. Just it, It's just endless. So before you go off and you start drawing a whole bunch of these, what I think is really helpful is if you just stop and take a look at nature. Now, I recommended to you guys that video that's out there called The Shape of Things by Nova on YouTube. That's a really great video that gets you to start understanding how nature works and repetitive patterns and design. But this is something that also you can contribute for because by thinking up all these different variants, it allows you to apply these to things that you're drawing. So what I thought I would do is just, you know, come in here and let's just take a look at some natural gradients and let's just see what's sort of taking place with nature. Right. So how do we make different gradients? Well, Let's go back to the basic. I, you know, when we think of stipple, stipple, if you had a basic drawing class or a rendering class, they teach you how to render by using pattern and tone by having a series of dots put together. So you could have thicker dots that come together, but you can see by looking at this, I get a gradient pattern that's flowing from dark to light. Okay. I think that works really nice. Um, here's another simple little gradient pass. OK, but it has sort of an etched metal feel. And what's cool about it is it's also at an angle. So if you think about it, you can still have a gradient tone going from 10 to zero. But in terms of black to white, but you can also angle part of that pattern and see how it develops. OK, and then happen to come across this. It's sort of like a this looks like somebody uh, like a stain 
glass effect done in Photoshop with a there's a filter in Photoshop that will do this that allows you to take a gradient pass and it'll make it look like it's actually a bunch of little pieces. OK, so, you know, um, this pattern is a really great example of having uh, contrast. So down here, when the black is more solid, we have less areas of white that's coming in. And then as we switch to the other side of the spectrum, the black is getting smaller and the white sort of taking over. So, you know, there's so much that you can do when it comes to basic patterns. And then this one right here is really, really sort of key to me because what's really neat about this is when you create a pattern or you're drawing a leaf or a tree or alligator skin or whatever it might be that you're working on, you need to think about your pattern wrapping over and around your subject matter. So you want to take your pattern and make it flow over the form of an object. And by doing that, that's going to make it more pronounced. And the pattern, it can it could still read, look at this, from dark to light, but it can also help go over your form and indicate um, how the form is moving and flowing. OK, so I think that's really, really important. You know, it's a definitely something to think about. So, of course, outside of general gradient patterns, let's just take a look at nature. And, you know, I can't describe this enough because I think a lot of us take things from nature um, for for granted. And there's so much to learn by how, you know, I noticed I like to do a lot of camping and I also like to ride dirt bikes. So sometimes I'll be out and we'll be with a bunch of buddies and we're up riding like in a couple hills and I look down and you can see a natural gradation and breakdown as things go from like dried out and cracked hard dirt as it breaks down into lighter dirt. So nature has its own ways of displaying these patterns and they can be really, really fantastic and they can work in a certain way, whether it be cracked walls, whether it be dried paint, whether it be concrete, you know, whether it could even be the pattern of wood, you know, wood even going in different transitions across different types of wood, even different types of dye. So even looking at the interior lines of that wood allows you to get in there and really draw and create a gradient effect. OK, and then, of course, looking I showed you this one before looking up really close at um, an example of a leaf structure or pattern. I mean, that's fantastic. Look at this larger. Before, when we looked at this, you, you know, you probably um, peeked at it and you might have noticed that there were these sort of basic. Hold on a minute. I keep getting sorry. Let me turn my touch off. Off. OK, I'm on my uh, other computer. It's acting up a little bit. So you'll see. Come on, go back to red. There we go. So when I first looked at this pattern, when it was smaller, I saw these sort of diamond trapezoid wedge shapes in here. Do you see that? Okay. But now that I look at it, now I'm seeing the diamond shapes in here. Do you see that? Look at that diamond shape in there, another diamond shape. And then within this, there's more little trapezoid shapes. So I'm seeing other things that I didn't even notice because of, oops, of part of the pattern scale in set feel. So, I mean, there's even a difference to the size of the pattern on how it's going to affect what it is that you're drawing. OK, you know, so I mean, I love this stuff. I mean, I think it's really cool. And if you can look at nature and pull something from it, um, this is a pattern from a blowfish. So this is part of the natural uh, nature's natural camouflage on that animal. So when it's down, and when it blows up, it even gets a, the pattern structure becomes more visible and it allows it to blend into certain areas with the ocean and within its own environment, you know. And there's something to say about that, too. You know, when you look at patterns in nature, you know, there is really a, quite a fantastic uh, evolution of, of, how do I say this, of, of nature developing um animals and plants insects bugs everything to fit inside their world and surroundings because part of me wonders like how long would it really take you know to for nature to figure out how to create you know scaled and colored patterns for example on a rattlesnake like this you know and how does it blend in what's the difference between a pacific north Northwest rattlesnake and you know maybe a rattlesnake you might find in the Appalachian Mountains because the colors are different so you know I mean I, that stuff fascinates me because I can pull some of that information I can translate that into drawing you know 
Um, this is a close-up of a leaf pattern um, that I happened to find online. I thought that was a pretty cool sample to look at. Okay, and then um, this right here is from a uh, armadillo. So this is natural defensive patterning of the skin going from one side, you know, getting smaller and branching out and getting larger and larger as it sort of recedes back. Um, and uh, that's a close-up of a leafy plant, right? I was trying to find, I, I've actually seen some really cool patterns before from a microscopic bugs. So, you know, you have to zoom into them with one of those heavy-duty, you know, microscopes, but you can really see some really cool, fantastic things you never thought existed before, you know, which really works. So part of this patterns, this, you know, understanding pattern to me and uh, taking a look at what nature has, I also like, it takes me another step further, further at looking at how nature fits more into sort of everything, especially the word flow, you know, and there's a harmony, the way lines continue to go down. And so this, it's another thing that interests me when you look at how, you know, um, this could be a definite pattern, right? That could be a pattern on part of a tree, um, even though this is sandstone with water going over it. And over thousands and thousands of years, the water keeps going by, and then you create this pattern, this flow. And to me, I find that you know pretty fascinating, especially anything that deals with water. Um, it has a natural way of not only is the flow of the water itself interesting and the pattern that that creates, but what the water does to um, all the other elements that are uh, that it's going through. Remember. Um, I learned this once in a science class that water is the most corrosive material that we have on this planet. And um, it, it might take a longer time, but it will, you know, go through lots of metals and it'll cause a lot of destruction over time. So there is a limitation to things being exposed to water. And what's really cool is you get to see these really fantastic. I mean, look at this. Look at the flow that comes through part of this. I mean, that in itself to me is really just you know, quite fantastic. You know, there's just such a nice pass through. And then even how some of these come up and they they bind and when they bind, it goes back into another set of a, another pattern sort of there, you know. So I, I think that's cool. You know, I think that works really neat. And I think there's really something to learn from that. Um, especially one thing I like looking at is whenever I have to draw a world and it has uh, a river or water that flows through, you know, water does really fascinating things to sand, um, and it and it creates really cool striped patterns. In fact, on that note, I, I didn't think about this. I should have grabbed a picture of um, of dunes. Like when I was younger, I backpacked to the uh, to the Sahara Dunes, and I was in Morocco and a little bit on the border of Algeria, and I got to stay in the dunes for a couple of days. And it was amazing to see what the wind does when it blows over the dunes, how it blows the sand into a really cool sort of like fascinating pattern, you know. So, I mean, there's a lot to look at in nature and to think about how things flow and how they bounce and how they turn, how they go around other rocks, you know. And I think part of that flow, not only is it going to apply to a drawing, but you can really take some of that and you can start applying that into a full-fledged environment, you know. In and what's cool, when I saw this image, I thought this is really neat because you have a pattern of leaves. And then on the pattern of leaves, when you put a whole bunch of leaves together, that itself is creating a whole new pattern, a pattern of canopy. And, a, and it's a, a pattern that you would need to, you know, overlap onto a 3D model if you wanted to, to have it make realistic. So breaking things down in the simpler form and understanding how they work and how they move. I mean, it, this is, you know, it's invaluable, you know. Another thing I like to look at is rock formations. Um, one of my biggest pet peeves with some of my students is they draw organics and rocks. And um, we will have a whole segment. I should do a whole demo on drawing rocks because there's so much to learn because of the, the structure of the rock and what's inside it. And so I came across this. And, you know, I have students, for some reason, students always want to fake like trees and rocks and to me those are the things that can't be faked you have to really look at them to get a good idea of how they break apart and how their structure is are they vertical structure diagonal structure 
what happens when they fall apart, what happens when they go into smaller pieces. You know, sometimes you see rocks in one large formation and then they get a little bit smaller. So there's even a pattern in here that you could apply, you know, that I think is pretty fascinating. Uh, another thing is looking at water and looking how highlights sort of trickle, uh, you know, trickle across water and how they bend. And all of those highlights are is light reflecting off the water's surface. But that light reflection is making it look realistic. So along with patterns, we also have the surface content. I know this is more rendering, but we have the surface content of the reflectivity of the object's um, material and then the intensity of the light bouncing off. So if you have a good light source and a shiny surface, you're going to get something like this. And then what happens to, I thought this is pretty cool, because here you have a pool and down below you have these the, the tile of the pool, but then when you have water in there, and when the water bends and curves, what it does is it reflects back some of this, the lines from the tile, and it creates this really cool flowing like topographical map, okay? And actually, once I saw this, I was like, oh, that's a great idea. I have to show something that deals with a topographical map. So I'll do that in just a minute because there's, to me, that's another great way to think at flowing patterns, okay? So um, hold on, we'll get to there in just a second. I came across this too. This is the an enlarged microscopic view of bone density, and that has a certain pattern of nature that takes place, the way you get these hollowed structures that make it light and efficient. But then again, it's thick enough to hold its core in, and a lot of bone looks like this. And um, what I always find fascinating is, you know, when people talk about us going to other planets and possibly living or meeting someone from another planet, part of their density is it an animal or individual is going to be adapted to the gravity of their planet, right? So, I mean, look at how cool this is that we even have, not only do patterns make up our skin and our exterior, but patterns go all the way down into the, into the interior of our bone and our tissue and all of our matter. Even when you look at, um, I didn't include this, but when you look at strings of DNA, they're mapped in a certain arrangement and also in patterns. So patterns are really a pretty great part of nature. Um, and then I came across this. These are snowflakes, right? The one thing we know about snowflakes is not no one. There's no duplicate of one snowflake. So every single snowflake is different. It has its own pattern, and part of that pattern is created by the way it's flowing, by the temperatures, about how it freezes, the kind of water it has, as if it's dirty water, clean water, uh, particles in it, um, the amount of sunlight hitting on it, um, how cold it is outside. All these different elements come to make a snowflakes completely different from each other. And if that's not fascinating, you know, I mean, to me, that's pretty cool. So here's that last section I mentioned about looking at a topographical map. And here's the really cool thing when you think about it, is that a topographical map, it has multiple patterns and textures in it because you're looking down on top of something and we see this really fascinating pattern structure that's taking place. But then on top of that, if you look at a topographical map from a side view like this, okay, look, you have a pattern here that's flowing, and this was an exercise where you're supposed to match. So looking at this, where you have two bumps like this, and then it decreases in the middle, that would be number three right here, okay? That would probably be number three or number four, or excuse me, number six would be that pattern. What about when we go over here, what happens when you have one high, one low? So we look over here, High and low is probably going to be number one matching to B. Or now you look over here, this is more high off to one side. That's definitely high with a steeper drop off. So number five would probably be C. Number two right here um, with the high point in the middle. That's got to be, I'm thinking that's got to be E. And so it's just cool when you look at this, right? Because now we have patterns depending upon the angle of view that we're looking at things. So if we're looking up from above taking a picture, you have a pattern. And then if you're looking down low at another angle, you might have a whole different type of silhouette read or pattern that's taking place. But I think that's cool. It's cool to think about because if I can transition pattern like this into a creature that I'm drawing and make him look like I never thought he would look before, that's going to be very successful to me. Okay. Anyway, and that's it for right now for talking about pattern. So as you go through, let me just come back to the very beginning here. 
when you're drawing, you need to go back and be able to think about, you know, what are my tonal gradations? And one of the things I noticed with struggling art students that go from a basic drawing point of view and they start going into like a rendering phase, especially into digital painting. A lot of students, a lot of people want to go right into digital paint and they don't want to learn this right here. They, they think that their knowledge is so you know, expediated. They don't, they don't have to take a rendering class. So whenever I meet students like that, it, it just sort of drives me nuts because I'm like, if you haven't learned how to master dark reads from dark to light and you don't know what a gradation is and you can't, I have some students that can't paint a gradation in, but they want to come in and learn digital painting. And I always say, well, go take a rendering class. Learn this in rendering, you know, while you're looking at objects and still lifes and then bring it back. So when you're out, looking now when you're drawing and you're sketching you need to really stop and think about hey what's what's the pattern of the object i'm looking at what's the intensity of the light where are my shadows where are my dark areas and if you do that and you apply that by using markers or using a, a prismacolor pencil it's going to make your your work look 10 times better because you're thinking about all these variations of pattern you're thinking about very patterns help indicate scale they help indicate transitions. They can help indicate dark to light. Uh, we talked about flow. We talked about harmony. There's so many different things that pattern structures come together to affect. Okay. All right. So I'm going to stop this and I'm going to start sketching. So we'll be right back. All right, guys. Welcome back. So um, what I want to do is I want to show you. Um, I'm going to, I have an organic sketch I want to cover. And then I want to show you when I was out the other day, here's something that I did um, when I was sketching, when we were walking around. So um, I want to talk about this particular method right now, which involves using Prismacolor pencil, which I think is a really great way to draw. It's really simple. It's a lot of fun. It smears easy. It's very forgiving. And what I really like about it is uh, the mileage that you can get out of this. So Here's what the pencil looks like if you want to buy one of these. The color that I'm using is called Indigo Blue. Sometimes they change the name and call it Blue Indigo, but it used to be called Indigo Blue on the pencil itself, okay? Um, sometimes I use black. So remember, here's a difference. This is, let me hold it to the cam here. That's Prismacolor. You see that right there? Um, it's different than Verithin, okay? Verithin... Uh, is made by the same company, but it's slightly different. So uh, it's a really hard lead. This is very soft and very waxy and very forgiving. So what I want to do is talk about drawing with this. And then I, what I wanted to also do is talk about what do I take with me when I'm out sketching, you know? So sometimes I bring my sketchbook with me. And then, you know, recently at school, um, one of my um, fellow colleagues and buddies, Mike Sheehan, who's another... Uh, awesome artist who's always out there drawing you know he really inspires me a lot because he's drawing he introduced me to this really great tone paper here it's pretty thick and it's nice for sketching you can beat it up you can use markers on it and so on okay so he here's the first image that I wanted to show you was this all right and then after this is done I'll try to go in and talk a little bit about using markers and pens really quick because sometimes I like to take those with me or I might have a limited amount of what I can take and I might just have one pen with like one marker and one white out. That's three little things and I can get a lot done from sketching with that. Okay. All right. So basically let's talk a little bit about, about how I got through some of this technique and what I did and how I got it to look the way that I did. Okay. So first off, let's talk about the tools that I'm using. So when I'm out drawing, I really like these little bags. Okay. They're a portable little bag like so and what I really like about it is this clip because I can hang it off the edge of my my pocket and then I could zip it open only about part way and I could reach in here and I could be grabbing out pencils look and they're not falling out even if I open it quite a bit it still takes a while for them to fall out so I never open it all the way I usually keep my bag about about like there and then I just have that hanging and it's just really convenient to reach in there pull out a pen really quick and it's you know it's, it's fantastic okay so that's really cool to be able to track that with you now um, we talked about the Prismacolor pencil and then here's another common tool that I use this is a kneaded eraser okay so I 
Um, don't ask me why. Sometimes mine are round. Sometimes what I do is I squeeze them into like these little blocks because I find myself using them to erase an edge. And then if I have to, I can pinch an edge like that and then I can get a nice fine edge and pull up just one area. So um, I've had my kneaded eraser for quite quite a many years. You can see how blue it is, okay? So I actually have different erasers that I use for different things. So that one is blue. I have another one in my sketchbook. Hold on. Just thought I'd show you. I don't like mixing my kneaded erasers with different colors because they sort of change on the pigment. And then when I sketch in red pencil, that's my red one, okay? And then I have another one that's almost like close to pure black that I use with black pencils. So um, to me, I like to keep a kneaded eraser for every color that I sketch with because it's going to change, all right? So another another cool thing you got to have is a pencil extender like this, okay? Um, this is a more pricey one. Don't ask me why. It's a German one. Um, I just bought it somewhere. I forgot where it was. It was a little bit more, but I like the color of the wood because I have a lot of drawing um, elements that are in this natural color of wood. But even now I'm looking at it, and I realize there's a bend in it like this. I'm like, man, that was like... 10 bucks when these normally run you can get them sometimes for five or six and then the other thing that i do is i put um i buy some of these eraser tips now this is made by pentel um they're pretty good uh, i like them it's a white polymer based eraser eraser and they have different companies that make them but you can put them on there sometimes i even take a an exacto knife and i don't know if you can see it but i've carved down a little bit of that surface there so it fits on without destroying parts of the eraser. So that's the pink eraser tip, which it's okay, but I find it rips the paper up a little bit. And what I don't like about these sometimes is if you get a little bit of black on there or a buildup of color, it'll smudge into the paper. And, and so that can be a negative. Brand new, they work pretty good, but I've been switching over to these Pentel ones because I think they're pretty nice. And then also, here's another little tool I'll carry with me. This is another, I know, I need to contact Pentel and tell them they should support my channel, right? Because I use their stuff all the time. Here's the Pentel slide out eraser. That works really good. Um, it's easy, you can replace it. It comes right out there, you can buy another one. You just slide it in, comes right back and it's really easy. What I like for this too, is you can take a razor blade and cut off the edge of it and get a nice, very crisp line. It works great for tracing paper in uh, rendering and drawing and sketching on vellum paper, okay? And then another eraser that I have here is, again, it's, I started with the Statler brand. Let me see if I have one above my art desk here. Do I have one? No. Let me see I have one in here. Show you what it looks like. Um, hold on. Actually, I can't find it, but that's okay. A Statler is just a white polymer eraser. And then this one is made by Pentel. I happen to get that for free, um, but I really like it because it's small and it erases very, very well. This is probably one of the best portable erasers that you can buy. And again, another Pentel product, right? So that's Pentel, that's Pentel, that's Pentel. Okay, now this next item I'm gonna show you is a little pricey, okay? They're made in Japan. They make all kinds of fine things. This is a portable electric eraser. I never take one of these in the field with me. I just happen to have them. And um, you can see mine have tape on them. I've had these for a while. These are $50 each. They're a little pricey. And how it works is it takes a set of batteries in the back right here, okay? You can buy one that's just as good that'll last you for the price between 10 to $20, not nearly paying as much, but I do, I've used Sakura for a while and I really like them. And then what's cool is you can buy replaceable little pieces like that. And then these pieces come in handy because you just pull them out, you pop one in. Now, I never take one of these out with me when I'm drawing. So when would I use these? Well, whenever I'm doing quick sketching or what I call like quick pre drawings, where I have to get something out. Sometimes I work digital, sometimes I'll work on traditional paper, and then I scan in my image. These are great for just getting in there and getting that white polymer eraser right on one little area that you want to change, okay? So there. So that way we covered some tools, and you see what are some basics that 
how you know what people can use. Okay, and what I'm going to start doing now is um, I'm going to get in here and just start sketching. And I'm going to do something really simple in the purpose of the demo here. I'm going to look at a big leaf or two, and I want to talk about a couple of different ways that you can use this tool. So I think what I might do is draw a couple sets of leaves in three different portions of the paper and see how they start to come out. Okay, one of the things about these pencils that works so great is they just work very soft, you know. So there's a couple of different ways that I like to draw with them. I like having one that has a blunt end on it like this. And that allows me to get in and I could just take a sketch like this. And I'm not doing anything major or fancy here, right? I'm just looking at, I have actually, there's a little bit of, a, I have a photo above me from a recent, when I was out drawing. Of a little tree leaf here. There's like another one coming off to the side, sort of like this. Okay, and then on the back here, there's another little guy coming over here. And there's another, it's like it was the growth area in the back here. There's a little bit larger one, a little bit of a point to it. And then there's one leaf sort of going this way and it sort of rippled over. Remember the last demo we talked about drawing that center line, getting that end of the leaf in there, and it sort of went like that, okay? All right, so now what I can do with this is that that's very, very light. And so what really works nice about this pencil is being able to come in and I can do this. Look, I could press down on here and um, hold on, I'm trying to find another piece. I'll just use this one. I could press down on this like this. Look at that. That's a pure 10 in terms of darkness. And then I can go lighter, 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 light it up, go very light and see that? Boom. Very efficiently with that pencil, I can create a really fantastic gradient flow. Okay, now I'm not telling you to get in there and press down super hard, but that's where this pencil sort of comes to life is that you can draw very light with it and you can get some really cool lines, okay? and you can get something that starts to work, but then we can come back into this and we can immediately change it very effectively. And so we could, I can really get in here and punch up some, some lights or some darks or some other shadows, okay? Hold on a minute here, let me get part of this. That had a little thing in here, there's something here. It's like a little thing wrapped around the side. It had another leaf, I just wanna get some of that other detail, all right. Like so. All right, so now what I'm gonna do, let me draw a couple other leaves over here and then we'll talk about with this pencil what are some of the different techniques that we can apply to having a drawing look really cool or doing something that you really like, okay? So, um, you know what, I'll go, I was gonna, I'll just draw. Um, I was gonna pause the recorder for a minute to save time. Another thing that I like, remember that's the blunt tip. And the other one I like is a medium tip like this. And I find that really great for holding like this sideways. So when I come over here and if I, if I sketch something, it's nice to be very loose and very efficient with it. And it has just a nice soft feel, okay? And it just feels great, you know? It's just, I'm barely even pressing down. I'm literally dragging the weight of part of the, the pencil down on top of what's here and look, within a matter of minutes, you know, just seconds, I mean, you really start to get something that feels very cool and it has just its own natural sensibility to it, you know? And over time, it takes a little bit of time to get used to drawing like this, but sometimes I get out there and what I don't like about drawing like this is it my range of motion is from here to here, do you see that? That's only about, it's a little bit more than 90 degrees. When I'm drawn like this, I'm connected now, my wrist is locked. So when I move my hand around, my shoulder allows me to go all the way up, all the way down, and it changes a lot of how the drawing's gonna look. So you can see the difference. These lines are a lot looser. These lines are a lot more crisp because here I have a little bit more control when I'm holding the pencil like this, getting my pen pressure down. Okay, so give me a minute here. Let me look over at my reference. This had this wide like leaf coming over like this. 
weird bend in it. All right. Okay, so let's say that's my other little structure, you know, and I'm uh, my plant. So remember, you're you're out inside an environment, right? You're drawing and sketching. You know, you don't. Your goal is to sketch something very quick and move on to another piece of subject matter. Okay, and then for the next one, I'm going to do is there is like this banana tree. Let me just do a couple others here. The uh, the banana tree or whatever. It's the one that has these big, floppy, cracked hanging over um, leaves. So the leaves are always sort of like this, they're always very rounded, and you can get that round shape very easy, but then they always have these like huge like tear cracks inside of them, and they range in size, and they come down to a base. Usually over here, they start actually like wrapping in on top of each other, and then they get all cracked up, and they're all sort of messed up. When I say cracked, I don't mean like the drug crack. We're talking... Uh, the shape of it breaking apart and then part of that structure you have all these other little like elements in there so here let me just throw and look it's so light now this I don't know if you saw that this smeared it right there that's why these erasers suck I should take that one off there but too cheap sometimes because I'm still using that one let me do this Take that off, take that one off, and now, voila, magic, right? There it is. So now I have it on there. So if I let, let's say if I come in here and have a light line like that, let's try it with the polymer. When the polymer hits that, the eraser is pretty good. Same thing with the kneaded eraser. The kneaded eraser um, just has a look at that. It almost takes off the whole thing. And the kneaded eraser, the reason why that works so good is it's like if you stretch it out, it's a very fibrous material. And so that fiber is picking up all the aspects of what you're drawing in there. But the only catch about part of that fiber is that um, some things it picks up better, like charcoal it picks up better. Remember, these pencils are a wax content. Because they're a wax content, they perform a little bit different. Okay, maybe there's something here. Smaller leaf that's starting to come out, but not quite all the way. Maybe something comes in here, like it's growing. There, I got this other plant here, so I gotta watch what I'm doing. That, and here, let me just throw another guy in here. There, let's just say it's a small, I'm gonna cheat my banana plant, even though it maybe would be a little bit bigger. I'm what I and that's pretty good. I'll just leave it like right like this for right now. Okay. And then um let me see if I can throw in another plant over here. Let me just sketch something with another broad leaf on it. Okay, so actually let's just make this really simple. Huge broad leaf plant. Whoa. Bam. But it, let's do one of our, our little Y guys. Remember the ones that have the Y at the end like this? And then what they do is um, they they have these curly ends to it. So then you get these little arms that come like this. So the base mounts in through here like that. That holds part of the, the leaf up. And then here where that comes, you have, hold on, I'm looking back at some of my reference really quick. I was drawing them the other day. They get these round curvy shapes and then come in here. Then that one comes around here. That one comes around like so. God, nature made a cool plant when they made this one, right? It's really quite fun to draw. Hopefully, you know, you guys watch part of this demo and then you're like, man, I just want to go to my local park and sketch, right? So that's that Y, that's the center. And it comes off here. It always, I notice it doesn't recede as far from there to there in the back. And then when you get a little bit closer, it gets closer to that center. Um, that main vein line inside the plant. Like that. Okay, so let's say I'm going to have that one. All right, so I think that's good enough there for right now. So there's a couple ways to work with this pencil. 
And then I forgot to mention to you, there's one other thing I was going to show you guys. Um, when I did my sketch here, see that? I came back in and I put white highlights on there. So you might be wondering, well, Phil, how do you do those white highlights? Okay, well, check it out. I'm going to show you. There's a couple different approaches that you can do. Okay, so one of them is right here. That's a white Prismacolor pencil that is white. Okay, that's one option. Okay, um, hold on a minute. I need to grab something out of my other sketchbook in the back here. The other option is this. That's a white marker. If you look around, especially if you go to craft and hobby stores, you can find those guys. And they are exactly what, they're just like a white crafting marker used for different types of, of sketching. And then the next thing I was going to show you is this. And I'm going to save you time and money. This right here is without a doubt, okay, the best white gel pen on the market. And if you look around and you go to like Jet Pens, you can usually get these guys uh, for about $1.50, 2 bucks each. They last a pretty good amount of time. And the highlights on here are great. So this is made by, okay, uh, Uniball Signio White Gel Pen, of course, made in Japan. Okay. Everything awesome in life is made in Japan, dirt bikes especially, okay, um, or it's made in Germany or Austria. It's just the way of the world, right? I mean, um, it's just really fine engineering. Okay, so let's talk about our main leaf here, our drawing over here. So here's the golden secret, is that if I want to make something pop on my page, I need an area of contrast, okay? Um, what you have to be careful of is if I get in here and I'm rendering around and I'm doing some textures on part of my leaf and I'm pulling this structure out a little bit, um, if I start putting blue down, and let me show you, if I put blue down like this, let's say I've already, I'm working on a leaf, and if I put blue down like that, and then I come back in here and I start putting white on top of that, my white is going to blend in with my blue to give me light blue. So what you have to do is sometimes you have to think ahead and you need to find a portion of the leaf and you need to say, hey, that leaf's going to have a nice highlight on it. And that part of the leaf's going to have a nice highlight. And that's going to have a little nice highlight. And then it'll blend a little bit like so. See, by doing that, what happens is the white is popping off the paper completely. Okay, that's what we want. So you got to ask yourself that question, right? So when I come over here, before I start, you know, um, drawing and smudging around a little bit, this is the leaf I want to pop right here. So I'm going to take my line. I'm going to sort of come along here, push. Oops. Don't do that. I went to move it and I pulled it too much to the side. I'm going to create a nice sort of thick and thin sort of contour line here, especially where the bend is. Whenever there's a bend, in a curve like that, I want to press down and get that nice thick little line. I'm getting thick and thin line that's coming up here. I might wrap some of this back into the plant. Okay, like so. And then I have a little bit of the thick and thin line coming down from here. Part of that wraps over and it's going to continue like so. So you can see by really pressing down on there, boom, that area starts to pop immediately. Okay, so now as I come in here to work on the rest of this, what I like to do, here's a problem with students, they come in, they put highlights here, 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 and here, and then it overkills it. So you can't do that. What you need to do is find one area, maybe a second area, is the primary highlights, and then everything else becomes secondary and tertiary, and it fades away. So one of the terms I used in class the other day was like lost and found edges, where you're getting parts of the leaf. So this leaf is going to have a little bit more detail on it, so I'm pushing up some of the line here with a little bit more thick and thin. Okay. Had another little accident there. I think I dropped the pencil there. I smudged that line over, but that's okay. All right. And then when I talked about the loss and found detail just a second ago, what I was referring to is I'm just going to come back here. I'm not going to put a ton of line on this. I'm just going to actually fade it in like this, very light. This is just going to act as a a support mechanism to the rest of my sketch. Okay, I had some lines going through here. 
So I need to do some of that thick and thin. So next thing you need to do is pick a direction you want your light coming down. Do I want my direction coming from the left or do I want it coming from the right? In this case, since the majority of my subject matter is on the right side, I'm going to pick my light coming this way. So because of that, this side back here is going to be my core shadow side. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I have another version of that pencil with a, a sharper tip to it. I'm going to push that pencil down along its side and get this really nice sort of broken gradient feel. Do you see that? Going right over the base like that. Okay, once I get that gradient in there, it almost, because I left a little bit of room, room on there for the edge, I can then come back and then lightly go over some of this and it creates a natural feel that makes it look like there is a gradation wrapping around part of that leaf system. Okay, the branch system, excuse me. Then I'm going to take my trusty uh, Kleenex, which I like to use. Another thing you could use is, these are great, by the way, is I carry one of these. This is like a glass cleaner. You see that for glasses? I carry that and then I'll wash them or if I get a new one and I use that as my portable smudge device. And then I'm sometimes I use this because the Kleenex will break down. And what I like about using this guy here is it will actually build up lots of blue. And then over time, it'll stay. So now let's say I don't have a smudge cleaner. You can see how I'm smudging and I already picked up some blue. Use your finger. Take your finger. Let's go like that. Boom. Look at that. Boom. It smeared it instantly. That simple. So sometimes you don't need to get, I mean, sometimes when I was in animation, we used these a lot because this was a technique that we used and people would use Kleenexes because you don't want to get your finger oil rubbing all over the um, uh, the vellum. Now, but vellum is a different type of paper. This is like a rough, thick cardstock tone paper, okay? All right, so now that I got that part done, okay, um, a little here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put a little bit of light and shadow on here. So I'm looking at this and I'm thinking of lights coming down from one side. Part of this here is going to be the shadow side. And then I might come over here and pick a couple little facades that might be hit with a little bit more shadow like that. Okay, I'll leave it sort of easy. And then voila, now I'm going to come in with my white. Okay, so I'm going to come over here. Now, when I do my white, it's going to be useful to think about doing white, there's a couple things that you can do. Um, some people do go like this and they render and create a beautiful gradation. There's nothing wrong with that. Something else you can do is I can use my white in a pattern of hatch marks like this or even curving to also indicate highlights but to also allow something to make a change in terms of gradient flow. So if I come back over to my piece here, I could come over and I could select an edge like, hey, you're going to be hit. And I could go like this and I could fade off that white highlight. I can come over on that little edge. Anytime I have a dark against a light, now you can see what happens when I hit that little edge, it blurred into a blue. Aha, that's why later I come in with this. At the very end, I come in with that gel pen and I'll touch that little highlight up there. So what I'm going to do right now is just come along part of this. Put some little highs in there. Get them along part of that edge come over here. So when I'm doing this, I need to think of some of the facades, right? What are some of my fa facades that are here that are happening right now? So by hitting one facade, it pops it forward. By hitting another, you know, with dark, it pops it down. So anything I hit with white is going to sort of pop forward. Okay. Now, I have a tendency when I've done this before in the past that I can overwork a leaf real quick. So what I do is I do this for a little bit, put a couple highlights in there, get it looking a certain way, and then boom, I walk away and I leave it and I go do another part, another drawing. Because what happens with me is like what I just said, is my eyes get used to what I'm looking at and then I over render it and I kill it. And I don't want to kill it. I remember I'm out here sketching in a park or whatever, and I just want to get the general feel of my subject matter and leave it alone. The last thing I want to do is I'm going to come in here, pinch a little bit more of a shadow under that, get that leaf out a little bit more. And then right here where the leaf is underneath part of that tree, I'm going to put a little bit of dark just to hit that and pop it. It's like, bam. So I put that in there like that. 
and that little bit of gradient control there, I'm going to come over, put a couple contour lines going over that. Okay, like that. All right, so boom, that's it. I'm done. Done with this leaf here. Maybe a couple little contour lines wrapping over just to show shape or form. And then I leave it alone. Okay, now there are a couple ways I could pop that in my sketchbook. And that's what I was going to try to show you in these other little demos here, these other ways. Okay, so let me jump ahead here and do this one. And, and here are the things that I could do. Number one, I could come over here and I could draw a line on this that's very dark and then shade an area of tone behind it. And then that'll get that whole thing to pop off the page. That's one thing I could do. Another thing I could do is I could come in here and on the opposite side where the shadow is. So if light's coming down this way, right? I come over here and I really punch in this dark line. And then I come back with a white pen and I put a bright highlight along that border. Boom, that'll get that to pop out as well, okay? Um, and another thing you could do is I could just keep all this really base tone and then I could put a white behind it. And let me show you an example from my sketchbook. I know this isn't the same subject matter and I, I know I need to show my sketchbooks. That's why I'm doing more cams like this. So here's some characters I sketched on my sketchbook. Okay, so do you see the white behind them? So this is what I'm talking about where the white pops the characters forward. So there's no highlights on the characters right now. Does that make sense? The characters are just sketched in with a little bit of marker and a little bit of red, and then that's it. So the white behind them, boom, pops forward. The only time I hit any of my characters with white is right where I want you to look, like on the tip of the nose, on the tip of this nose, right on the eyeball right there. Even here, I got busy, I had to leave, and I forgot to put some mark on the tip of his nose. Okay, so that's the difference. So if I go through part of my sketchbook here, sometimes I just sketch whatever depending on what I'm doing or where I'm at. This is my, my current character design sketchbook that I'm working on, right? So here's another example, right? Here's some other sketches. I know you guys are like, why does he not put this stuff up on, on you know, Pinterest or not Pinterest, but um, Instagram. And I'm like, I know because I get so busy, I fall behind, but I will. Trust me, that's my... I'm trying to spend the rest of the semester into the summer just doing a lot of demos and recording myself drawing for you guys, okay? Now that I got the cam set up. So here I did the same thing. You see the white block behind the character? Boom, it pops the character off. There's not a lot of white highlights on that character at all. It's just on the ears and on the notes, okay? So the same thing that happens in my good old trusty sketchbook is going to happen here when I'm drawing. So what I'm going to do... Um, is just to make it different, I'm going to come up here and I'm going to do that thing where I punched up this back line here. I'm going to make it really dark in a couple areas like that. So it gets it to pop a little bit more. And then I'm going to take my trusty little ruler and I'm going to actually, you know what, I'm going to cheat it and do something I learned that's old fashioned. I'm going to put a square block behind my tree here using good old fashioned removable tape here. Okay, so here I'm gonna tape this off like this, like this. Now, if I was in the field, I wouldn't have my tape with me, right? Right, which is fine. So for now, it'll work for what I'm gonna do here. There, like this, this is removable tape. It's blue label. So if you look and you go by tape, see the blue? The blue label is removable, which is really fantastic. If you're on a budget, you can take normal tape, put it on your Levi's a couple times or on your hand. It'll pick up the sweat in your hand and then it, it'll do, it won't allow you to um, um, to stick all the way to the paper. Okay, now that that's done, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to come in here with my pencil, sort of effortlessly, just with the weight of the pencil. Okay. Down there. And I'm going to come over right here. Now, going with the grain of the pencil, excuse me, the gr going vertical like this against the tape will create a hard line. So I've learned over time that if I just turn my thing a little bit like this, and now come this way, just very light, trying to get a simple gradient. Excuse me, I'm not getting a gradient, I'm just throwing down tone basically. Okay, like that, that's it. Simple, done, right? Then what I do, 
So I take my magic portable cloth right here. Okay, I'm gonna come on and boom, smear this. You can use your finger. You can see what happens when I go to smear it, right? Man, does that stuff just darken up. How bitchin' is that? There it goes. Okay, pretty cool, right? I got that in. Now what I'm gonna do, now sometimes I notice I miss a corner or two. So like up here on the tape, I can draw off the tape a little bit more. And if I wanna do a little bit more of a gradient, so what I'm gonna do is just darken this area just a little bit. I always notice I tend to miss my corners sometimes. So what's the golden rule? I want that leaf to pop that secondary, right? So this leaf has to have the biggest area of contrast around it. So when I'm sketching, which the great thing with these pencils, right? You could smear and then come back and smudge again. See, I can put down, it's picking up the gradient feel of the, of the not the graphite, but it's wax, of the wax and putting it down, which is fantastic. There it goes. Okay, I have that in there. Hold on, the best part's coming up. Smudge a little bit more right there, a little bit there, in that corner. There you can see how it all comes off with my little smudge rug. And then I take my little X-Acto knife. And you, by the way, you can reuse this since it's removable tape. So I'm going to stick it up here. I put it up on the top of my upper shelf on my art desk. And then the magic. See that? I get that nice little block behind there. Okay. That allows me to pop my leaf a little bit. So that's one thing that you can do. Now I'm looking at it. Hold on. Now I've changed my mind. I know. You're like, Phil, come on. Sorry. The artist in me, right? So I want to continue that block. Let's bring it all the way over to the side. It looks sort of cool. It is getting late at night. My eyes are getting a little tired. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to do the same thing. And do this a lot faster. When I'm doing a demo, I can sit here and uh, take my sweet time. But when you're out drawing in the field, you know, um, you don't want to eat up all your time. You only have a certain amount of time or there might be a quick pose or whatever. Okay. Cool. That looks good. And it will not pull off the paper. Another secret right here, when you pull off tape, don't pull it straight back. You'll notice I'm pulling it like this. Pulling tape, that's pulling tape at a 90. Does that make sense? Pulling tape that way will allow it to come off. Sometimes if you pull it straight back, it'll pick up some of the fibers on the paper. Okay? Look, that guy's done for right now. I'll come back later, and I could take my gel pen right here, and then I might put like a little highlight like right here, here. This will be nice, true white highlight. Do you see that? Even if I come over here on the tip, get a really nice white highlight right in there. I might come up on part of this edge here, a little bit right there. That's what makes the, the gel pen really fantastic, okay? Now, you'll notice I put highlights in there, but I haven't really gone in and put any uh, any contour line detail. So I have some cool highlights that are working, but let's go to the contour line detail before I finish up here. So I have a pretty, you know, decent sharp pen tip there, and I'm just going to lightly press, find my contour line going in here, have it splitting off in my branching structure, going across part of my... Now this is definitely one of the last things you'd want to do, because it's really hard to get this, these lines in here, and then be able to draw on top of them. So getting this little linear detail, you know. Oops. Okay. There. All right. Now, I'm doing this out of my head really quick, so... 
part of me just looked at part of it and said, wait a minute, that wouldn't be like that, but that's all right for the demo purpose. That's the benefit of looking at something at life is getting to mimic those key things that you see, right? So now I'm not really seeing anything. It's just coming out of my noggin really quick here. And I really press down on that corner where there's some overlap, put a little bit of value here, get that down like that. There it goes. So you see how cool that little, you know, getting those little lines in there. Okay, let's leave that one. Let's go over here and do another one. So that first one, little block, block behind it, right? All right, so let's jump over here out of this guy. Now, um, I'm going to see if I can speed this up here a little bit more. Contour line is key, thick and thin, thick and thin lines, the way it wraps over and how everything sort of comes together, you know. You know, actually, you know, um, the more you sit down and you sketch like this, and you just do it quick, you lose your inhibitions to care. You know, you don't care anymore. You just want to get in there and carve it out. Just let it come alive, you know. So on this version, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep, I'm just going to render out more detail with my pencil and I'm going to start getting some dark and lights happening in here and I'm going to not put any highlights and then tear the leaf and then put a white block behind it and see what happens. So this was the tone block over here. Let's see what happens when we switch it up another notch. Already learned my lesson about playing anything in the background so YouTube won't take out. Okay. And then actually, so I like that quite a bit. I'm gonna go to my my dulled end. Use that to get some other little details in here. Talked about texturing a little bit. So light's coming this way, so a dark side back here, okay. So I'm trying to get some of that bark to pop out a little bit more on some of the shadows, right? And then even here, what I'm going to do on my leaf is where that contour line breaks, I'm going to imagine that there's like little dark light areas. I'm trying to get more of the shadow of the leaf to sort of come through. Um, hold on a minute. Sorry, um, my stuff's rolling off my table. And the other day I just ordered something new that'll help. I ordered a new mat that I can put on my, my art desk. This is one of my art desks and I'm actually on a light table and then I have a monitor in front of me so I can draw. So what's cool is I can be working, see, and I can turn on light if I have drawings or whatever and I have this plexi surface that's really fun to draw on. So it, if I'm doing something traditional, because a lot of times I like doing traditional. I think it blends in and there are times where you need to do digital, but they're definitely, and I come from a, a background of all traditional, so. Okay, and this other stuff, just let it fade. Lost and found edges, look at that. We know it's a leaf, we get it. Our brain sees the connection. Hey, look, there's something there. We know it's there, right? Very light. Look at that, just barely even dragging. Just do it with my finger, just barely go over it. Not smearing it at all. Okay. Here now. Let's get this. All 
that. Smear it going over a little bit more. Okay, now let's take our magic tape. Let's put a white block in there. Okay. Let's go across like that. There, I can't even see if I'm doing it straight. Sorry, I've been drawing for a good part of the day and my eyes are about shot. Those of you that were getting angry, where's the other drawing organic demo number one? I know, I was trying to finish it. Sometimes I'm, I get blocked up because it's just me, you know, and I'm busy. You know, I'm teaching and sometimes I'm doing freelance and I'm being a dad trying to do all these other things and it's easy to get drawings backed up. Okay, so now let's take trusty white here. Same thing I just did before. So I'm just gonna come in here, try to make sure, and I gotta be very careful if I get that white along too much. of this blue, I'm sorry, I'm speaking in broken words because I'm focusing. If I get that white right onto that blue a little bit too much, it will get in there and turn that into a light blue. And it'll make a mess of what I have. Like I just did it right there, it got very blue. Did it right there too. So sometimes you just say, screw it. Just go in there, throw it down, get it in, try to go the other direction to get the spots I missed. Man, I learned so much from rendering. I had a great teacher. I had a guy named Mr. Mr. Miller, Mr. Bob Miller. And what's really cool is I had him when I was 18. And then I also had this other teacher that taught us a lot about drawing and form named Mr. Graber at Bernardi Urban Junior High. I don't know whatever happened to him. Someone told me he's still around, but I got to find him one day and say, hey man, thanks for uh, being such a good teacher. So I'm using tape, I'm cheating because I'm at home. So if I wasn't at home, you don't use the tape. You just sit there and you draw a little. So what, what you can do, let me see if I have it in here, I'm pretty sure I do, is I have a little small ruler. Oh, I did have it. I have a little small ruler for my sketchbook that fits right inside my little zip pocket right here. By the way, these, these things are really cool, man. I should call it, tell these guys to send me a couple. The Acura C, they're these, they fit, they have a small and a large. This is the large. The large is the only one that'll fit in on eight and a half by 11 paper. It's got a little pocket right there, holds your pens. You have a little zip thing that's open. Boom, have your pens inside there. And when I wanna go sketch or draw, I'm at the car wash, I'm at the store, I'm killing time, I'm waiting for, to pick up a pizza. Boom, I have my sketchbook with me, all my stuff in it. I don't have to go hunting around trying to find something. You just sit there and pull it out and go to town. You know? I think one of my favorite things to do is have my sketchbook quickly available and just being able to pull that out and like jump right into it, you know? Okay, cool. I got that white in there. Got it smeared a little bit there. The white doesn't quite smear as well. I'm just blending it a little bit like that. Okay, that's done. And, um... Let's peel our tape off. Okay. All right. There we go. Okay. Different look, different feel. But for this demo purpose, right, you can see how it works. Now, what's really cool is I can punch that up with my white marker. You see where it's blue around it? Look, bye-bye. See, that marker gets rid of some of it. And what I like is this marker actually goes over part of the prisma and it starts to blend it in a little bit, like so. Thank you. 
Okay. All right, so that's way number one. That's way number two. Okay, it's up to you. All right, so um, let's let's go on to this guy down below here. And hold on, let me just darken a couple of these little lines here, make this pop a little bit more on that edge. Now, I didn't hit that leaf with any highlights, did I, remember? I told you if I do too much, it'll kill it. But what I can do is come in here and just go, put a couple like on the tip, like right there, going over the plant, along maybe one of the edges. Remember I showed you my sketchbook and my characters? Doesn't need a lot, just needs a little bit, that's it. Boom, you're done. Leave it alone. Go to the next next one, okay? All right, so this next one, let's see what we want to do with that one. Um, gosh, you know, it's, you just get into it and you just start drawing and you see how it, how the drawing starts to come out, you know? Sometimes you don't always have all the answers. You just got to get into it. Leave it alone and see where you end up. I made that leaf too thick, so I decided to throw another one in the back here. And just darken part of that guy up. Leave him alone there. Okay, actually, I did this the other day in my sketchbook. I'm going to draw all the reverse leaves behind these leaves, make them dark, and then make these front leaves pop forward, if that sort of makes sense. So I want to try to keep these a little loose in the front, like so. Just nice little thick and thin lines. Contour lines, get some interior line in there. That, not too much, okay. And hold on, let me get this guy over here. Got part of this in here. I'm getting a nice little gradient flow in there from my, my pencil being on the side. That's the other reason for drawing with these Prismacolors, man. You draw with them on their side and they give you these great little gradients that you never even thought like of how to use. And you just, I'm just lightly coming in here and throwing in little marks and put a little shadow and boom, it makes it work, you know? Pretty cool. And stuff like that happens. The other one is, I'll do that on the last one. It's putting white behind it, the white line. I don't know, sometimes I don't like that as much. Just depends on the flow of the piece. Uh-oh, am I still recording? Sorry, just got a huge warning from my recording software. Your computer is about to explode. Please pay attention to it. Get some more texturing in there. It's like little round circles in there sometimes. And they go to big blocks that look like the plant's been partially affected, almost like it's got dirt and wind and stuff on it, you know? Yeah, that's pretty cool. Okay, so now that those lines are done, Okay, that's good to go. Let's now, 
I need to pop that. So I'm going to lightly sketch in here. I'm going to have a leaf that's going to drop back behind that, right? So maybe coming from in here, I have a leaf that comes here, and that leaf's going to come down to here. And I'm just want to make sure I only get the silhouette of it. So I'm looking at the back of the leaf. I'm imagining the center lines going like this. I'm going to use that to pop forward the leaf in front of it, okay? And then I'm going to do the same thing here with this front, but this time maybe the leaf needs to come over a little bit more and bow down here and be slightly turned a little bit more like this. Oops, I that dark line there, it's way too dark. So I'm going to pull that bad boy down. Way too dark there, I didn't mean to make that that dark. Shade that in with some value right in there. Remember, talked about this the other day in the class. I tell my students, push and pull value. You know, when you want to push something down, you make it a darker value. When we want to pull something towards us, we make it lighter. It's that simple. I had a student recently tell me, I don't like to draw trees. I just want to draw characters all the time. I'm like, I've learned more from drawing trees and vegetation. By the way, I'm doing this out of my noggin, right? This is from going out and sketching all the time and drawing, right? You just get used to the way things look. So um, I'm starting to just pay attention more to the technique than anything, you know, but... Um, I learned so much more from just observing nature. That's the same thing I had a student the other day like, hey, Phil, what do I need to do? I want to learn how to become a great digital painter. What do I need to do? I'm like, okay, go grab a thing of watercolors and go out and do plein air painting every single day. And you will learn more about light and color and transitions of light and color and temperature and how uh, light is affected by the, the time of year, the, the intensity of the light, the hue of the light, the time of day. You learn more from that than you will doing anything else. Okay, this one's going to be a little hard in here. I need to erase. I have this one weird line here. I'm going to take that out right there. Oh, the other thing I forgot to show you, you got to have the handy dandy camel brush with your name on it, of course, right? Demetriotis. No one can take it. Look at that. So you don't smudge your, your drawing up. So what I want to do is I want to get something... Coming, I want a positive and negative shape that goes between these two here to here like this. So what I'm going to do is lightly come in here. Imagine this leaf shape going sort of like this. That's the edge of it. That's going to be like the underside of it like that. Okay. So that's the leaf going in the opposite direction behind me, getting my plant to pop right now. Okay, that's cool. I like that a lot. And then I'm going to come back here. Let's make a leaf going back away from me as well. Right? Remember, what do the leaves do when they're in the back? Remember, they get up to the top. The new ones are coming out. So that one might have been a little long, but let me see if I can... A little too thin, I meant to say. See if I can fade that in just a little bit. What I'm going to do is do one little pass with my finger. One there. One in here. A little smudge pass in there. A little bit there, a little bit there. Okay, and I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to make it look different, like it's being blown by the wind, and so it's not the same shape as the leaf underneath it here. Okay, 
And then another one like right there. And that'll make it feel a little better to me. Look at that, that's all you need to do, man. Look at how friendly that pencil is. By the way, I'll tell you right now, buy them by the box. Don't even bother ordering one at a time. They charge you two something, buy them in a box. It's nice to have them all. I'll just burn through them. I'm gonna make this edge a little crisper. Just take a little bit off of it right there, a little bit there. Now, no, I wouldn't do that if I was out drawing. I wouldn't have the time to. I'm just being spoiled that I'm sitting here on my art desk, okay? So that's another style right there, okay? Now, what I would do here at the very end is um, I didn't do any texture passes in these yet. So I didn't put any glops. Glops. That was gloopy spots mixed together. That's something that I do sometimes. I do these little things I call noodle mods where I combine words. I tend to do it when I'm tired. A little bit fatigued. I'm getting fatigued because it's it's what is it? It's ten o'clock at night, and I've been working on these, been doing demos all weekend, and some other stuff, and drawing characters. I'm gonna darken my line just a little bit, coming from the middle, because even a dark line that has a gradient to it, thick to thin, helps me sell part of that structure. Okay. So I like that. So I like that a lot. And then what I might do at the very end here is come in with my handy dandy white pencil and just put a couple of highlights. Maybe a little bit on the end here, a little bit over the edge there. I tend to notice I do highlights better when I'm not thinking about it or talking in a demo. I just wait. Do them all like at the same time. That's it. A couple little highlights there, a couple on this side. Break them out a little bit. You got to press on that pencil sometimes, you know? You, you know? You own that effer, right? Own it. Press that guy out. Sorry, I don't mean to swear. I have a couple of kids that watch this channel. Yeah, so that to me is plenty. If I put two, if I do more highlights in there, it's going to kill it. And what I really want to do is I want to get a nice sweeping highlight right in here. Boom. Coming up that leaf right there. Do you see that? And then I want to come down here, get one off the edge here. Get another one there. Little guy there. One little dude there. Pop that guy a little bit. Now... Since that's popping, I have the leaf. I forgot the leaf behind it. You see it there? That needs to fade to the back. Okay. And then once that faded to the back, same thing here. A little bit on the tip, on the edge. Right in there. Okay, same thing over here. I did not define that tip very well. So I'm going to punch it a little bit more. Press on that pencil, get that white little highlight out of there. That's it. Leave it alone. I think that's plenty. I don't want to do any more on that. Okay. Now let's go do our last leaf. It's going to be our fourth style. Okay, so um, our first style was highlight one or two places with a darker gray box behind it. Our second style was a white box to get it to pop a little bit more. Now I'm looking at this now that I have a fresh set of eyes and I realize I can push the white here a little bit more off that edge. Get it to pop a little. And then I want to gradate the white coming off the back here just a little bit. Because it went from, from bright to like very to dull. So I'm just going to put a little bit of a light 
white gradation going back in there like so. Okay. And then our third style was, this is one of my favorite that I just like to do all the time. It's something I picked up from working around sketching environments on paper, which is uh, a shadow behind your objects with a little bit of white highlights. And now our next one is going to be a, a blue outline with maybe a shadow behind it, but then with a nice strong white line behind the, the tree leaf itself to get it to pop. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is come in here. I wanna try to make this a little bit loose. Get a couple values. So I drop my pencil down on its side. See if that helps me find a little bit of, these have these really cool leaf structures, excuse me, veins is what I meant to say. The veins come all the way down. It's really got to look at these, these little Y. I don't even know the name of them. I know somebody does out there. I'm going to get an email tomorrow. Phil, the plant is called the Pluteus Maximus Originus Adonis of Tropical Peruvian whatever. I'm just making stuff up. I'm tired. There we go. Let's get that in there. Excellent. Cool. All right. Now, when I do the little line detail, I'm trying to do it in sporadically. So I put a little line detail here. Maybe there's a couple little circles. Maybe part of this breaks off this little edge here. So you can do that really quick with the side of the pencil too. All right. So if I do that side of that vein in there, and I just throw a little bit of more value down the side here, a little bit coming on that leaf. Actually, I'm too busy getting caught into this. I didn't pick left or right, so I'm going to do left light coming this way. So when I have those little veins, the right side, I'm going to make the leaf a little bit darker. A little bit darker on that side. There, okay. And um, that's part of the base to it. And what I might do to, here, let's, let me just show you now. Let me just show you. I'm just going to go ahead and hit it. Let me just see if, if I can use this. You'll see this a lot of times when people sketch books. They just come along and they go, okay, I'm going to make you. You want contrast? I'll give you contrast. That's it. Boom. They put that white line behind it. They keep coming in. that. See that? Makes it pop. Question is, the white line gets addicting. How much of that white line do you want to put on there? So now to get it to pop more, I need to darken that interior line that's in there. You see that? I'm going to put a little bit of shadow under that edge. Coming off like that, I'm going to throw a little bit of a coarse shadow going down there. Okay. And um, let's just line. Sometimes people break the line up a little bit. Everyone's got their own thing. Just do what looks cool, what you feel. That, okay. So now it's popping already, right? What I want is, I let's see if I can sharpen. I want a nice clean tip like that one so I can get some of the 
those real thin little high spider lines, branch life, not branch lines, they're the, hold on a minute, I'm too busy talking, I need to just focus here. The vein lines is what I meant to say. So once I get those veins, so now they're starting to develop a little bit more. I don't want to make it the line too thick on the other side, so I want to have lost and found edges. So a little bit darker, like right in here, I'm going to press down, then I'm going to lighten it up. So and then when I go into a curve, there's a curve, I'm going to press down in there and darken that up. And then come back to the next curve and darken that up. Okay, so that's my fourth, okay? Four different variations there, right? Now I, I am, I don't know, I, part of me wants to put another leaf in there. This leaf is all by itself, but that's all right. I think for the length of the demo, I think it's okay just to wrap it up here. You guys get the point, right? So I'm gonna do another demo after this and we'll talk a little bit about markers, okay? So let's look at what we have, okay? So that was the demo for, that we did today and then Look at the difference. That's me out just knocking it. Hold on, I'm trying to get it straight. I'm looking up at my cam window. It's showing me, but there's a delay. So that's a little bit more rough paced. You see that? That's when I don't have quite enough time to go into it. I try to limit myself 15 minutes per little bush or tree or whatever, and boom, I go to the next one. You know? So look at that. I like that. It's a cute, it's a nice little page. It works, it's simple. Boom, knock it out, you go to the next one. And look, the other thing too I pick on my students about is fill your pages. Look, I have all this area up here now to do more leaf studies. I have an area back down here. I call that a dead corner. There's nothing in it. I can do another study there. That's all that matters. You know, fill up your pages. Have really great pages. People like to look at sketchbooks and to see your work. And they want to see that you're out there drawing and sketching because you know what's funny? You know what gets people really good and better? If they're, it's not doing a whole bunch of finished pieces all the time and paintings. It's going out and drawing and sketching and looking at nature and looking at light, looking at texture and shape and form and taking all that stuff in your noggin, you know? Anyway, thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you later. Talk to you soon. Have a good night.